All right, this presentation is, is not a case study about the Olympics or how the International Olympic Committee used DevOps or anything like that. This is basically a look at performance. And I think when we start to look at performance uh, of releasing software, of IT, of our organizations, we're oftentimes looking for a pill. It's been you know, common in our society to look for the quick fix, that there, there's a simple solution. We sometimes almost want a formula. We want to you know, have step A, step B, step C, and that's it, and we're done. And unfortunately, what we found in the DevOps community is life is not that easy because DevOps is really not a technology problem. It's really oftentimes a people and process issue. And so DevOps is a lot more like a Zen garden where you have to really contemplate the nature of things and then decide what it means to you and then make changes in your life and in the lives of people around you to achieve the behavior that you ultimately want. And so that's what I'm going to ask in this presentation is that you step back, that you kind of close your eyes at points and really think about this. Uh, write down the principles. If you have a, a notepad handy, I'm going to be giving you uh, seven, uh, 10 different lessons here. You can write them down or download the presentation and, uh, and just think about what they mean to you and your organization. All right, first off, what's an Olympic medal worth? Think about that. People go to the Olympics, they spend their, their whole lives questing after standing on a medal stand and getting an Olympic medal. The gold medal at Sochi was composed of 525 grams of silver wrapped in 6 grams of pure gold. That was the metallic content of that. So effectively, it's, it's silver inside and gold on the outside. It has a worth, a street value, just from the metal perspective, of about $600. What's the silver metal worth? Silver metal was composed of 525 grams of silver. So effectively, it's the inner core of that gold metal without the gold. The worth of the silver, $370. The bronze metal is a mix of copper, zinc, and tin. It has a street value of $3.50. It's not very much when you think about it. People spending years and years in training, going after something, they just simply don't do it for the money. So the good question is, why do people do it? Why would you spend all, all your life, many years of your life, in training, working out, hard, long hours to go get a maximum of $600 worth of metal, and you know people will do this, you know, will be thrilled at getting $3.50 worth of bronze. Jesse Owens, who was one of the great Olympians in the 1930s, has a quote. He said, if you don't try to win, you might as well hold the Olympics in somebody's backyard. And I think that that really sums it up. It's really about winning. It's really about achieving your best. It's about the competition and the medal is simply a recognition of who won. So the DevOps lesson number one is find and articulate your motivation for wanting to do DevOps. What is your objective? What are you trying to achieve? Are you doing it because you want to improve your business in some way? Are you doing it for fun? Are you doing it because everybody else seems to do it? What would constitute success for you? If you get through this process and at the end uh, you have you know, uh, um, uh, some outcome that results, how are you going to know whether you were really successful or not? You have to sit down and really identify your motivation for wanting to go through the process. And at the end, what are you really, really trying to achieve? Now, how many people watched the Olympics in Sochi and saw the slope style competition? This was the first time that they had had it at the Olympics, and it was crazy. I had seen a little bit of this before, but I spent a lot of time watching slope style. Uh, this is snowboard slope style here, and they have all these various uh, obstacles that the guys uh, slide over, 
they have these huge giant jumps that they go off of and they do you know six eight turns in the air uh, before landing they get uh, higher than a building when they're doing it and it's something that's pretty dangerous there were a couple guys that actually got hurt in the process this is the metal stand for snowboard slope style and you can see everybody's pretty happy there the guy on the right side of the platform is from Canada and his name is Mark McMorris he won the bronze medal he's one of the youngest Olympians on the uh, on the Canadian team this year and he was in his teens he also won the first Canadian medal now you can see that the guys at Burton snowboards are pretty happy with him standing up on the uh, metal podium there he's got his big Burton snowboard and he's basically advertising it to the world I'm sure Burton uh, pays him, probably sponsors him, and uh, they loved the advertising that, uh, that they got out of that. Uh, similarly, this is Ted Ligeti, who is from the United States. He won gold in the giant swallow. And you can see that Ted skis on head skis there. And you can tell that the guys at head, I'm sure, are pretty, pretty happy about that, too. Nothing better than having a great picture of a gold medal Olympian with your skis right in, his, uh, in the crook of his arm. So the question that I would have is, now think about you. Could you enter the Olympics with this equipment if you just went out and bought a Burton snowboard or head skis? Could you strap those on and compete in slope style and compete in giant slalom and think that you might actually get on the medal stand? Now the former Olympians that are on the call, uh, obviously maybe that is you. Maybe you actually could do that. But for me, I know that the equipment is not sufficient for me. This was the uh, United States new speed skating suit that was announced in January of this year. They call this thing the Mach 39 speed skating skin and it is a tour de force of technology. It was actually co-developed by Under Armour, the performance clothing people, and Lockheed Martin, the guys that put satellites into space. It took them two years to develop this thing. They spent over 300 hours in the wind tunnel. They actually started off capturing the movements of speed skaters using high-speed cameras. They created a complete uh, computational fluid dynamics model of the airflow over skaters' bodies. They used mannequins uh, in the wind tunnel and they came up with hundreds of different design variations and, and tested those in the wind tunnel to see exactly which one would deliver the minimum air resistance for the skater. That resulted in a suit that was, again, the most advanced of its kind ever. If you looked at the top of the suit around the head and in very strategic places on the body, there were these little bumps that they called uh, flow molding. And what this would do is break up the airflow that was going around the skater's body and actually reduce the amount of friction uh, that the skater was experiencing. They designed a, a special stretchy zipper that was ultra comfortable and they offset it off the Adam's apple so that skaters would not be tempted to pull that down at all and in so doing open up the suit and increase the resistance. In the back, they molded a special vent to keep the skaters cool so that they, again, would not be tempted to open up the suit in any way that they could stay tightly wrapped up, but at the same time, they would be cooled uh, even as they were uh, expending a lot of energy skating. Now, this is my favorite part. This little gray area here between the thighs is called armor glide. And it turns out that that reduces the coefficient of friction between your thighs by 65%. There's a lot of jokes that are probably buried in there, and I'm not going to go in them. But uh, suffice it to say that, again, this suit is uh, very technologically advanced. This is a guy named Shawnee Davis. He's 31 years old, and he is an amazing speed skater. A partial list of Shawnee Davis' accomplishments uh, is on the screen. He was the first black athlete to win an Olympic gold medal for an individual sport. He won the gold in the 1,000 meters and the silver at 1,500 meters in Turin, Italy in 2006. In 2010 in Vancouver, he repeated that. He's won the World All-Around Championships twice. He's won nine 
World Cup titles. He has 53 career victories on the speed skating circuit. He has eight world records. As of the time that I wrote this presentation, three of them were still current. So Shawnee Davis is an amazingly good, amazingly fast skater. This is what Shawnee Davis looked like in the 1,000 meters losing while wearing the Mach 39 speed skating skin. He placed eighth. His competition that day was a guy named Stefan Groteis from the Netherlands. And Stefan is not wearing a Mach 39 speed skating skin, but he won the gold medal. After this happened, this was such a tragedy. Johnny Davis was the favorite. Stefan was not. And the, uh, the American team was in big consternation about the fact that Shawnee Davis had lost. Some other key U.S. skaters also lost while wearing the Mach 39 speed skating skin. This was so bad that the CEO of Under Armour actually had to appear on CNBC to defend the company and the suit against all these allegations that actually made the skaters slower. The skaters held a meeting and they voted to go back to the old suit, which was also made by Under Armour, that they had been wearing previously and not wear the new Mach 39 speed skating skin. This is what Shawnee Davis looked like in his next race, the 1500 meters, wearing the old suit. He also did not win. He placed 11th. His partner that day, his pair, I guess I should say, was a guy from Poland named Zbigniew Brodka. When he's not uh, skating, Zbigniew Brodka is a firefighter. He came in uh, 27th in Vancouver in the 1,000 meters, uh, 1,500 meters rather, and was not expected to place at all in Sochi. He skated the race of his life, and this is what Zbigniew Brodka looked like on the medal podium with the gold medal. DevOps lesson number two is this. Your tools alone will not make you successful. Patrick Dubois said that in an interview that uh, BMC did with him uh, a few months ago. And I think that's as true now and will be true forever. Fundamentally, DevOps is not about tools. And I think oftentimes, uh, as practitioners, we often start with tools. We start trying to automate things. We start trying to look at uh, processes and, and tool chains to accomplish our goals because those are oftentimes very easy things to do uh, and frankly they're kind of fun but the reality is it takes more than that in the same way that uh, Shawnee Davis by simply strapping on a Mach 39 speed skating skin was not going to win and his big new broad could beat him simply by skating the race of his life sometimes the tools just don't matter Fundamentally, DevOps projects succeed or fail based on organizational change issues. We see that time and time again. It's not a technology problem. It's really an organizational change problem. Now, this is Michaela Schifflin. She, whoops, was there a question? Yes, Dave. Um, there are, we had um, quite a few people that only have just recently heard the term DevOps or don't really know anything about it. Could you give us just a little bit of a, an overview? Sure. Fundamentally, DevOps is about how to make the interface between development teams and operational teams as smooth as possible to ensure that code that's developed by developers, applications, are released into production in as smooth a way as possible. What the world was finding was that oftentimes there was this big wall between development and ops, where developers were creating code and then leaving it at the, at the door outside of the data center, metaphorically, and ops people were letting it sit there for months and months and months until they could get around to fundamentally uh, getting it installed and up and running. And, and the fundamental cause of this is because uh, development and ops people are really compensated on different things. Uh, developers are compensated based on creating code, creating new functionality, and getting that done as quickly as possible. Ops people are oftentimes compensated on things like stability or performance, which are really hampered if they are changing things frequently. 
And so there's this big mismatch between the speed at which development works, especially in shops that are using agile development uh, methodologies, and operations where people are incentivized to make as few changes as possible. And so DevOps seeks to harmonize that, to have uh, things simply flow between the two. All right, did that answer the question? Yes, thank you, Dave. Excellent. Well, so this is Michaela Schifrin. And in addition to being Drop Dead Gorgeous, Michaela Schifrin is the gold medal women's slalom champion from Sochi. She's also the youngest women's slalom champion in Olympic history. She was 18 years, 345 days, just shy of her 19th birthday when she won the gold medal in, sl in uh, slalom. She's already been on the World Cup circuit for quite a while. She's won seven World Cup slalom races. That's more than any other women, woman in U.S. history other than Tamara McKinney. Uh, it's safe to say that Michaela Schifrin, if she keeps going on the pace she's on, uh, will be the greatest U.S. women's skier in history and quite possibly in the world. She's one of the people that is that good. Now, one of the questions that naturally arises is, why is somebody so young so good? There's a few things that you could think about. Well, she's, she might have started young. And that's true. Michaela did start skiing when she was just a kid. Obviously, she's got a lot of natural talent. You don't get to Olympic caliber simply by being a bad skier and practicing really, really hard. So there's some, some aptitude that she's got naturally about it as well. But the thing that I think really um, distinguishes her from a lot of her peers, because there's a lot of other people that have natural talent and also start young, Michaela Schifrin came from a skiing family. Her parents loved to ski, and they wanted her to grow up skiing. And they focused a lot on providing an environment that would allow her to focus on the fundamentals. Many of her peers, when they were kids, were off on the junior uh, uh, co competition circuit in skiing and were competing regularly. Michaela really wasn't. Her parents took the position that said that they wanted her to focus on making the perfect turn and getting through the gates really, really cleanly rather than simply going for the fastest time and possibly adopting a lot of bad habits before she had really learned all the fundamentals uh, and making those bad habits part of her repertoire where they might give her a slight advantage in the short term but would really hamper her long term. So she was the girl that was on the mountain first and off the mountain last over and over and over while her peers were off traveling the country competing in the junior circuit. So DevOps lesson number three is this. Make sure your fundamentals are solid. Now what are fundamentals in our world? First of all, have you identified fundamental skills that you need to be successful? Here's a, here's a sample list. Things like programming, automation development, server management, middleware management, database management, network management, program management, process management, change management, defect and incident management. These are all pieces of development and ops that need to be working together to ensure that changes from development get adopted in operation smoothly and quickly. And so if you have weak spots in your organization, in your skill set, you need to really go look at those and focus on bolstering those before you start trying to uh, create you know, huge DevOps change. One of the things Michaela Schifrin does as well is she trains all the time. Now, if you think about this, you know, it would be really bad if you simply slapped on skis every time that there was a World Cup race, but you didn't ski any other time, and you didn't train any other time. So Michaela trains year-round. Whether there's snow or not, she's always trying to strengthen her body so that it's, it's, it's in top physical conditioning so that she's ready when those races come. So I'd ask you this. When was the last time that you released something that you didn't have to? just for the experience of doing an application release. 
For most organizations, the answer to that is never. We only do releases when development's done and we absolutely have to release something into production. I would submit that that's a big problem, that we need to start looking at that and start uh, practicing just for the sake of practice. And so that's DevOps lesson number four, practice, practice, practice. Focus on practicing your releases so that when the time comes, when the actual application release is there and it needs to be released, that you're ready for it, that you've conditioned your organization, your skills to be ready for uh, execution when the time comes. Now I'd ask, what's your cadence goal? Many of the folks that we talk to uh, about DevOps are a little bit intimidated by it initially. Some of the early DevOps practitioners were folks in Web 2.0 companies that were moving very fast. They were doing releases multiple times per day. Developers were pushing things into production uh, you know, with a mouse click and doing it on their own initiatives without a lot of sign off and things like that. And, for some brick and mortar companies, that's intimidating. You have change control boards, you don't move nearly as fast, you're doing year, yearly releases right now and you wanna ideally get down to every six months or even maybe every quarter, but you can't imagine releasing something, the same application multiple times per day as developers check in code. Um, figure out what that cadence is. But one of the things that I would submit to you is whatever feels fast for you now won't feel fast for you once you achieve that goal. So Michaela Schifrin, right after she won the gold medal, said this. She was being interviewed and she said, so right now I'm dreaming of the next Olympics, winning five gold medals, which sounds really crazy. I'm sorry I just admitted that to you all. Right? Even as she was basking in the glow of being the youngest slalom champion in Olympic history with one gold medal, she was already setting her sights on multiple multiple gold medals down the road. And I submit that you'll do the exact same thing when it comes time to releasing. So DevOps lesson number five is don't underestimate how far you can go. If you set a goal for every six months or every quarter right now, once you hit every quarter, you'll start looking at doing a release every month. This is Marlies Schild from Austria. She was Michaela Schifrin's primary competition in the slalom uh, championship in, in Sochi, in the slalom race in Sochi. And she uh, is an amazing skier in her own right. She has four Olympic medals, three silvers, and one bronze. And she came in second to Michaela Schifrin in the slalom. This is Ted Ligeti. We've already seen him with his head skis earlier after he won the uh, giant slalom. He's actually got two Olympic gold medals. He's got a prior one for an all-around combined uh, from an earlier Olympics. This is Maria hofel Riesch from Germany. She has four Olympic medals, three gold and one silver. In Sochi, she won a gold medal for the all-around. And she is uh, probably the best all-around women skier uh, at the moment. Finally, this is Tina Maze from Slovenia. She has four Olympic gold medals, two gold and two silver. Also an amazing skier. Now, what do all of these skiers have in common? They all race routinely on the World Cup circuit with Michaela Schifrin. And it turns out that Michaela Schifrin goes to school on these people all the time. After every race, she watches video, not just of herself, but of all these other skiers in order to pick out the best parts of their technique and try to adopt it as her own. So she looks at the way that uh, Maria Hofer-Reese carves a turn or Ted Ligeti waits or unweights his ski as he's turning. All of these things she then tries to mimic in her own. So her, Michaela Schifrin's own style is a composite of all the best practices, if you will, of all these other skiers. So DevOps lesson number six is this, benchmark yourself and incorporate every best practice that you can find, you know, pull from the industry, pull from your peers, pull from other industries to figure out who uh, has figured out a trick that makes things go faster, smoother, and, uh, and more reliable. 
there's always another bottleneck behind the most visible one that you see today. So you're going to go through, and as you start to adopt DevOps, you're going to see a bunch of bottlenecks in your process, in the way that you work, and you're going to have to bust through those. But you're also going to, as soon as you do that, see more behind that. Keep working on those bottlenecks. And so that really brings up DevOps lesson number seven, which is be make benchmarking and best practice adoption a repeating habit. Oftentimes, people do this once or very periodically. They don't do it metaphorically after every race the way Michaela Schifrin does. And that's a key thing. After every release or uh, you know, on a fairly fine-grained uh, cycle, you should be sitting down and having a post-mortem and saying, what can we do better? Where were the rough points? What can we smooth out? This is the U.S. two-man bobsled team. Um, the U.S. two-man bobsled team in the 2010 Olympic Games in Vancouver came in sixth. They were racing a sled that had been designed 20 years earlier by Bodine Racing, which is a, uh, a race team that's affiliated with NASCAR in the car racing industry. And that's pretty common in bobsled. In fact, the German teams have a relationship with, uh, with uh, uh, Mercedes. The Brits have a relationship with McLaren Racing. There's NASCAR teams and other uh, uh, race teams in Australia and Japan that work with those teams as well. And so it's pretty common to have sleds that are actually kind of coming out of the automotive industry. Well, after uh, coming in sixth in the 2010 games, the Olympic bobsled team kind of stepped back and they said, we're racing a sled that's 20 years old. I bet we can do better. And so they approached BMW and asked them to help them design a new sled. And BMW assigned Michael Scully from BMW Design Works USA in California to help them with this project. Scully is a race car driver, and he's the, the, the chief designer at BMW Design Works. So he is absolutely used to working with uh, people that go fast. He goes fast himself. He, he absolutely understands speed and what it takes. The first thing that Scully did was he said, okay, if we're going to go back to basics, I want to take a ride. I've never been on a bobsled. So he went to Lake Placid with the U.S. bobsled team and actually took practice runs with the team in the back of the sled. Afterwards, he said, it just destroyed me. He said, halfway down, I didn't know if I'd pass out. Now, this is a guy who's used to going you know, well over 100 miles an hour routinely, and yet uh, being in the back of a bobsled was one of the scariest things that he had ever done. After that experience, he came back to California, and he basically tore up the plans for the sled. And he said, look, the, the old design is out. We're going to start from scratch. We're going to go back to basics. And he looked at redesigning everything. He uh, basically redesigned the complete shape of the sled. It went through just a ton of uh, airflow testing. He used carbon fiber in the sled itself rather than aluminum. And in doing so, uh, he saved 15 pounds from the overall sled weight. Now, it turns out that a regulation bobsled has to weigh, by regulation, 374 pounds. So the weight savings was actually used to place, to add back in the weight in a very strategic place. So what they could do was lower the center of gravity of the sled, make it more stable by moving where the, where the weight was actually uh, applied. So the weight savings helped them out a tremendous amount. They went through and again uh, made mock-ups of, uh, of the sled. They put it through wind tunnel testing. They went through 69 different design iterations. So a lot of, of tweaking and performance tuning. And one of the things that was really interesting was that this didn't always work. There's a great quote by somebody out there, anonymous, who said, in theory, there's no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. And that's what Scully found as well. Things that sometimes looked great in the wind tunnel, when they got them on the track, were slower. And he said that the bobsledders themselves could tell at the end of a single run whether something had worked or not. They, they would jump in the, in the new sled, they would try it out, and at the end of the run they would say, it's slower. And they would look at the times and that would be true. 
So this is the final sled uh, actually on the track at Sochi going down, taking a run. How did they do? At the end of this, the f they got the first two-man bobsled medal in 62 years for the U.S. bobsled team. They came in uh, third and got a bronze medal, $3.50. The women who were using the same sled did even better. They got a silver and a bronze. So obviously there's still some work to do, but the sled had a really great effect on the team, uh, allowed them to achieve medal stand performance, which is uh, great given that the U.S. team has not traditionally been a huge force in bobsled. Scully at the end of it said, this has been the most intensive project of my career. He said, I will confess, I loved it. So DevOps lesson number eight is this. Don't be afraid to change your existing tools and process. Sometimes you need to go back to basics. You need to look at the overall design, not just optimize a piece of it, but look at it end to end and say, what can we do to really design this to make it work well? And that's not just tools, that's people, that's process as well. So you can't simply automate your existing bad process and expect a significant return. Many people, again, working from a tools perspective, simply go in and say, I want to automate what I'm already doing, but if you do that, you'll end up with simply a bad process that runs faster. Instead, break it down and build it back up step by step by step. Okay, who is the greatest Olympian of all time. If you said Michael Phelps, you're right. He's earned the nickname Golden Boy for the amount of gold medals that he's won in multiple Olympics. He is far and away the all-time leader in medal count. If you look at the top medal winners, Michael Phelps is at the top, and he's dominant not just for the number of medals he's won, but by the number of gold medals he's won. So the next two folks in line are gymnasts from the former Soviet Union. Now, the first three people on this list are from the Summer Olympics. The fourth person is from the Winter Olympics. So who's the greatest Winter Olympian of all time? It's this guy. If you don't recognize him, this is Ole Einar Bjorndalen from Norway. Now, what sport does Bjorndalen compete in? If you said biathlon, you're right. Biathlon is a sport that combines cross-country skiing with target shooting. The competitors shoot at a distance of 50 meters away from the target, both standing as well as lying down prone. The prone target is 1.8 inches across, and the standing target is 4.5 inches across. If you miss a shot, you need to take a loop in the penalty loop uh, for every uh, miss that you have during the competition. So you can see there that people are skating by on the right side of the screen there, the very right edge is the shooting line, and people are shooting and they're coming off that, and then based on the number of misses that they have, they have to take that many loops through the penalty loop in the center of the screen there, and then they ski off on the track. So fundamentally it's a timed race where you have to shoot, so you have to shoot quickly, and then if you miss, you get penalized with additional skiing that you have to do. In Sochi, Bjorn Dahlen won two gold medals. His first Olympics was the 1994 Olympics in Lillehammer, Norway. His best finish in that Olympics was seventh. So he's been to a total of six Olympic Games. Here's the thing. He's 40 years old. Now, I'm in my 40s, and I'll tell you that that gives me a lot of hope. If you can be an Olympian and the fourth best Olympian of all time and be 40 years old winning a gold medal in Sochi, that's phenomenal. Michael Phelps 
in comparison, was quoted as saying this after his, uh, his wins. He said, this is my 20th year in the sport. I've known swimming, and that's it. He said, I don't want to swim past age 30. If I continue after this Olympics and come back in 2016, I'll be 31. I'm looking forward to being able to see the other side of the fence. The silver in Sochi in biathlon uh, in the race that uh, Bjorn Dahlen won was won by Dominic Landertinger from Austria. He's 26 years old. So a 40-year-old man beat a 26-year-old uh, in a sport that's very, very intense, I might add. So this is a, a phenomenal thing. It really gives uh, me a lot of personal hope, and it should give us a lot of hope as well. So DevOps lesson number nine is this. DevOps is not just for the young, venture-funded Web 2.0 companies. The fact is that even stodgy brick-and-mortar enterprises have leading-edge web apps. But one of the things that's going to be different or difficult for you is that you're going to have to train harder. The fact is, is that Web 2.0 companies, companies that are just getting funded, new startups, they don't have all the baggage that you have. They come into it oftentimes with um, younger people, with skill sets that are more attuned to, uh, to DevOps principles. Uh, you might not. You might have an organization that's big and stodgy. In the earlier, one, uh, earlier poll questions, we saw that, you know, 36% of people said that they were at a very bureaucratic company where it was going to be really hard to go change. And so you're going to have to train hard to overcome that bureaucracy. So don't underestimate the amount of calories that you're going to burn to go get that done. It's going to be tough, and you're going to have to think about it very, very carefully, about all the steps that you're going to do, the wins that you're going to go for early to prove that things work, and then to really uh, uh, help the organization change and reach its goal. Now, in the Vancouver Olympics in 2010, the figures, pairs, uh, ice dancing rather, was won by Canada's Tessa Virtue and Scott Moyer. The silver was won by Merrill Davis and Charlie White from the United States. In 2014, those places flip-flopped. Davis and White won the gold, and Virtue and Moyer won the silver. Question is, what's common about both these teams? The commonality is that they have the same coach, Marina Zueva, who's a former uh, Soviet skater, actually, uh, coaches both teams. They both live in Michigan, and uh, as does Zueva, and they're both going to, both teams actually are going, are attending the University of Michigan. So you could actually see this at various points during the Olympic coverage on TV. Marina Zueva had multiple jackets that she would wear, one that was a Team USA jacket and one that was a Team Canada jacket. And when they would sit in the kiss and cry, which is that little area where they sit where they get their results, uh, she would put on the appropriate jacket for whoever she was sitting with, and then she would take it off and run over and watch the next pair skate and then uh, uh, put on a different jacket. Marina Zueva was a skater herself, and this is a picture of her uh, in 1975 at a competition, a European competition in Berlin with her partner Andre Wittmann. And she and Andre uh, scored well there, but did not actually win a medal. And she was never in the Olympics. So DevOps lesson number 10 is this. You need a good coach. Think about uh, somebody who can uh, keep you honest. The function of a good coach is not necessarily because they've won all the gold medals. Marina Zueva hasn't. But she's a great coach because she's able to work with people and help them change and achieve their potential. And the key thing that you need to do is get somebody with an outside perspective who's not going to let you get discouraged, who's going to work with you and give you a kick in the butt when you need it, and who is going to cheer you on and, and help you achieve all of the goals that you ultimately want to achieve. Um, and so Marina Zueva is that for these two teams. I submit that as if we're going through a painful organizational change process as enterprises, 
we need the same thing. We need an external voice who's going to be a great coach for us, who's going to cheer us on. And that doesn't necessarily, again, need to be somebody who is uh, super excellent at DevOps. It just needs to be an outside voice. So the most important things, most important skills a coach brings are an outside perspective and an ability to motivate you to keep going. All right. I've given you 10 lessons. We've looked at the Olympics and different facets of it. Let's go back and recap. Remember the medals. Remember that they're not worth very much at all. And so ask yourself, what's my motivation for doing DevOps? Remember the Mach 39 speed skating skin with Armor Glide. DevOps lesson number two, your tools alone will not make you successful. Even though Shawnee Davis was wearing the Mach 39 speed skating skin, he still didn't skate his best. And folks that didn't have all the technological advantages of the Mach 39 speed skating skin were still able to beat the U.S. team simply because they skated well. Remember Michaela Schifrin. Remember her going to school on, uh, on all of her, of her competition. Remember her taking practice runs over and over again. Make sure your fundamentals are solid. Remember her training. Practice, practice, practice. Remember her saying her quote, so right now I'm dreaming of the next Olympics, winning five gold medals, which sounds really crazy, right? You never know how far that you can go, so don't underestimate yourself. What seems like an incredible pace for DevOps may not be so incredible once you reach the next milestone. Remember her going to school on Marlies Schild, on Teg Ligeti, on Maria Hofelrich, on Tina Maze. Benchmark yourself and incorporate every best practice that you can find. Further, make benchmarking and best practice adoption a repeating habit. Do it over and over again. After every release, actually go through and uh, try to figure out what you could do better and figure out if there's a process change, uh, a skills change, a tool change that would actually help you out. Remember Michael Scully and the bobsled team. DevOps lesson number eight, don't be afraid to change your existing tools and practices. Throw out everything that you've got, go back to basics, look at things end to end, and redesign it from the ground up. Remember Ole Einar Bjorndalen, the 40-year-old who beat a 26-year-old at biathlon. DevOps is not just for the young, venture-funded Web 2.0 companies. Even old companies, even brick-and-mortar companies can go ahead and do DevOps well but it's going to take more calories. Remember uh, Davis and White, Virtue and Moyer, and uh, Marina Zueva. DevOps lesson number 10, you need a good coach. And if you, I think, adopt these fundamental lessons, you can achieve DevOps gold. Thank you. That was not only informative, it was very entertaining. Now, while we group the Q&A in the background, Lisa Schwartz, our COO, is here to share some information with us. Hello, Lisa. Are you there? If I can get myself off mute, I will be. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine, yes. Okay. so. Uh, just a couple of uh, comments. First of all, Dave, as you know, I'm an Olympic freak, so I loved it, um, particularly the analogy of the Under Armour and how that um, believing that you, you know, spending all the money you can on tools is not necessarily going to help you win at all. And I just seeing those pictures of Shawnee hurt my heart again because I felt so bad for him. But anyway. Um, I did not know about the cost of the medals, so I loved that information, and I will be utilizing that at the next cocktail party I go to, so thank you for that. Third, I am absolutely calling shenanigans on the polling and how many Olympians we have on the call with us today. You don't think 7% former Olympians are on I the call? I do not think that 7%. Seems a bit high, I, I will admit. <laughs> 
I think that there are probably 7% of the people who are Olympians at their jobs, but actual Olympians in a way. If I'm wrong, please chat in to me um, what your sport was because I am fascinated and want to personally, personally thank you and congratulate you, but mostly just shenanigans on that. And um, I have kind of came up with a fun idea. Sometimes um, I just like to do things to amuse myself because that's the way that um, things go. So we have recently, we've been delivering a DevOps overview course for quite a while now. And um, we have a lot of people who are coming back to our webinars. So well, I've been giving out some free seats in the DevOps overview class um, for the last couple of webinars because we've been doing a lot of presentations around DevOps and Agile because that's what our um, audience and alumni has been asking of us. Um, but I've come up with something that I think is going to be a little bit fun. Um, we have a DevOps Foundation course, which is the newest certification course um, added. Well, actually, Agile Service Management Foundation and DevOps Foundation, which are accredited certification courses um, with exams similar in format to the IDLE Foundation. Um, and I've decided I want to give a free seat in the DevOps Foundation class, but I think because of the shenanigans of our 7%, it has sparked me to create some shenanigans of my own. And here's the rule of engagement. I would like, if anyone's interested in that free seat, um, and there are two classes you can pick from, September 29th or starting on December 2nd, we will award one free seat, but it's going to go to the person with the best story of why they deserve the free seat in DevOps Foundation. And you can submit, doesn't have to be long, because we really don't have time to read a lot of long things, but you can submit your um, request, why it should be you, to info at itsmacademy.com, and I will um, compile those anonymously, put together a little team internally, and um, whoever Whatever the team decides, sort of like the um, Olympic panel of judges, whoever gets a 10.0 um, is going to win that free seat. So if you want to participate and be in the first group of uh, foundation certified DevOps individuals, then um, feel free to send in the reason that it should be you. And again, we'll do that anonymously. Our panel of judges won't know who's who. And somebody is going to win that free seat for um, telling us why they deserve it. So how's that for fun for you, Karen? That's a lot of fun. I like that. I know. That's, that's what those seven percenters get for their shenanigans, I've decided. <laughs> and uh, Karen, did that give you enough time? I didn't see that many questions. Did that give you enough time to compile? Um, I, I don't have any questions. So if anybody does have questions for Dave, if you can chat them in now, that would be great. And did you get any coming in through Twitter, Lisa? Um, let me just double check that again. I lost my. Uh, okay. Give me one while second. You, while you check that, I'll let them know about the October webinar. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay. So I'd like to remind everybody that our next webinar is scheduled for Thursday, October 16th, when Mark Middleman, and Mark is the manager of solutions development and support with the U.S. Postal Service, he's going to join us with clean <laughs> solutions. Agile Transformation at the United States Postal Service. Again, that was Lean Solutions, Agile Transformation at the United States Postal Service. And the postal business is changing at a really rapid pace, and the Postal Service must continue to change quickly to remain relevant and competitive in today's marketplace. So what they've done is they've implemented the Agile methodology, replacing the traditional waterfall methodology to improve project communication, increase customer satisfaction, realize business benefits quickly, and improve overall quality. So please join us as Mark outlines the challenges the Postal Service faced before using Agile, how Agile has been implemented across the enterprise, lessons learned, benefits, and where they are headed with the next Agile transformation. So we hope you can join us for that. And also, while we continue to bring, we will, excuse me, we will continue to bring practitioner presentations discussing Agile and IT service management, because we know that everybody likes to hear the experiences. They want to hear what's going well, what's not going well, what the challenges are that people are having. 
So if you would like to share your implementation experiences or your challenges with us on a webinar, please let us know and we'd be happy to work with you to make that happen at any one of our webinars. And I don't have any questions, Dave, for you this afternoon. But I do have a lot of thank you so much. That was a great, great presentation. Excellent webinar. Learned a lot. So we have getting a lot of um, comments for you and congratulations for you on the presentation. Excellent. Thank you. If anybody has any questions that come up later, feel free to uh, shoot me an email. The email address is there on the screen or follow me on Twitter and you can connect with me there. And Karen, I do want to mention that um, to the polling question that we got at the beginning that um, kind of a bigger percentage than we thought were really very new to DevOps. So what I did was I chatted out to the entire audience the link to the recording of a Web, of a webinar we did months ago, which is what is DevOps? So if some of this was a little out of context for you because you're an Olympian but not a DevOpper, <laughs> I'm not over that yet, um, then there's a link in the chat window that will take you to a, a very kind of um, this is the history of DevOps and this is why folks are moving toward DevOps. Um, and then just want to say to Karen's point again, our um, webinar audience loves when we get um, practitioners who have hands-on experience stories where they're willing to tell sort of what went wrong, what, what went right, and what went wrong. And um, we try to make that as easy as possible for you. So, you know, everyone on the call has a story about their service management journey, whether you believe it or not. And we would love to um, help you cultivate that story and, and put it together into a webinar presentation um, because those are, you know, um, those are timely and people certainly do enjoy them. Right, and it doesn't have to be a completed implementation. You could just be starting an implementation and just tell us how you got to where you are at this point. Exactly. Where you were, where are you now, where, where are you now, because it is, you know, it is a process. So absolutely, we would love to hear you. So thank you. And again, thank you, Dave. That was just so much fun and very entertaining. And I can't wait, like Lisa said, to go and share some of these tidbits of Olympic knowledge that you've imparted on us now. And I love the analogies. I mean, the analogies with DevOps was great. So thank you so much for that. My pleasure. <laughs> you gave us great cocktail party fodder. So it's always appreciated. <laughs>